Uh, first, I would like to give credit to my colleagues, uh, Yulis uh, Tunkai, Karan Ganju, and our advisor, Carl Gunter. As you may know, Android relies on a permission model to regulate application access to system resources. Before version 6, this was known as the install time permission model. Back then, the user will go on the official Android application store, select an application to install, and then she will have to accept all permissions the application requires as a predicate to, uh, as a precondition to install the application on her phone. Now on Android, these permissions are categorized based on their production level in four different classes, uh, and all of them are granted, were granted with this scheme at installation time. Normal permissions are automatically granted by the system since they uh, protect non-sensitive resources on the device. Signature permissions can only be granted to applications that are signed with the same developer key as the application that actually defined the permission in the system. Dangerous permissions can only be granted by the user and signature system permissions are only granted to applications signed with the platform key. These are system services and system applications. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm not gonna be considering the latter kind, and, but it doesn't really affect anything in our discussion. Uh, the reason I'm not gonna be considering it is because it doesn't affect third-party applications, and my third model is focused on third-party applications. Now on version six, Android finally switched to the runtime permission model. This was a much anticipated change that we as a community have been advocating for for a very long time. Uh, and with this change, now dangerous permissions are requested from the user when the application actually wants to utilize them. So it provides some context to the user to make the right decision. Uh, moreover, Android organizes permissions in what is known as permission groups, and it does that to reduce user burden. Uh, for example, a group might consist out of a number of dangerous permissions. And for usability purposes, if the user grants one dangerous permission to an app, the system will automatically grant the remaining dangerous permission uh, to uh, the app automatically. Now, on top of the system-defined permissions, Android provides third-party developers the ability to declare their own custom permissions. And uh, this can be used for, from an application developer to protect their own application components. On Android, these components are content providers, which are essentially databases, can be background services, can be broadcast receivers. These are entry points to the application that can be triggered by different system events, or it can be activities. These are graphical user interfaces that can be designed to perform a single task on the device. Now, the most common use scenario of custom permissions by third-party apps is to use them to protect these components with signature permissions. This way, a Skype component, a uh, component in the Skype application, if it is protected by a signature permission, then it means it can only be accessed by Skype itself and also by other applications that are developed or owned by Skype. To find out how prevalent this security feature is on uh, the Android ecosystem, we downloaded the number of top three applications from all the uh, Google Play categories, and this yielded a total of 1,300 apps that were able to decompile and analyze. And out of those, we found that 65% declare custom permissions in the system, 70% actually request them and use them for their operations, and in total, we found a total of 1,350 custom permissions declared uh, by these applications. Uh, so the takeaway here is that custom permissions is a very widely used security feature on the Android ecosystem. However, when studying the permission model, we found that there is no clear distinction between system-defined permissions and custom permissions. Essentially, the Android framework is completely oblivious to the source of a permission. This treatment is at the very least hazardous since system permissions are declared by the system itself, which is a privileged principle, whereas custom permissions are declared by untrusted third-party applications. However, we found that the Android permission model does not take this important distinction into account when making enforcement decisions. Of course, when you do that, things start to go wrong. Uh, imagine, for example, installing this application, which declares a custom permission with a production level normal, and also it assigns it to the microphone permission group. This application also requests this custom permission at runtime, it wants to use it, and also it requests the dangerous system permission to record audio. At this point, the custom permission is automatically granted since it has a normal protection level, and the sensitive uh, permission to record audio, it's not. 
So now if the application is trying to use the sensitive API on the system, the user correctly uh, will be consulted. Um, so this is the expected behavior. So, so far, so good. However, this is the however part. If now the application developer creates an update of the app, let's ironically call it a security update, that changes the protection level of the custom permission from normal to dangerous, now the application can silently start recording in the background, essentially bypassing the user interaction requirements of the Android runtime permission model. So alarmingly here, the application was silently granted the dangerous permission to record audio, which is something that it should never uh, have happened. To make things worse, the adversarial app can use the same trick, the same technique, to gain access to all sensitive system resources. Everything that is considered sensitive of the device, whatever it is, camera, location information, body sensors, pretty much everything. And the main issue here is that, again, the system doesn't check whether a change in a custom permission um, is actually a change in a custom permission. It just treats it as a, as a change in the system permissions in general. So it cannot distinguish between the two kinds. Um, of course, we have reported this to Google, uh, which have acknowledged, has acknowledged it as a serious security vulnerabilities, and it's already uh, taking steps uh, to address this in the future releases. The second observation, observation we made was that not only we cannot distinguish between custom and system permissions, but also we don't have the ability to know who is the owner of a custom permission, so who declares a custom permission in the system. And things, again, can get messy when you don't uh, track the owner of a decision in the system. Consider, for example, Skype, which has this activity that can be invoked to trigger its ability to place a phone call. Uh, this activity is protected by the Skype developer with a custom permission. I'm going to call it Skype permission here, which has a protection level signature, so it can only be invoked by Skype itself and by other Skype-owned applications. The problem here is that custom permissions are identified based on their developer declared name, which the system cannot really control what it's going to be. Uh, the system only is going to enforce a first-come, first-served policy on the system uh, to declare a custom permission. So what can happen here is that you can have another application, let's call it application A, that comes inside the system, gets installed before Skype, and this application can now declare the Skype per permission first. Uh, now application A can collude with a second adversarial application to get access to Skype's phone placing functionality in the following way. Application B is going to request the custom permission at one time. Now the context within which this permission is going to be requested and the text that is going to be presented to the user is completely controlled by the adversarial apps in this case. So we expect the user to eventually grant the application to the second permission. When that happens, the adversary can now again update the first app to remove the declaration of the custom permission. This will allow Skype to get installed on the device, and now Skype is going to declare what it believes to be its own permission, and it's going to use it to protect its sensitive uh, task. Uh, however, application B already has that permission granted in a completely different context and can exploit that uh, to access the sensitive functionality of Skype and can start placing calls to premium numbers. It can call a remote adversarial domain, enable them to spy on the, on the user's device. Uh, and again, the problem here is that custom permissions, um, custom permission names are arbitrarily defined by third party, by untrusted third parties, and the system does not have a good, does not have any way of tracking ownership of these custom permissions. This was also reported to Google, which has also acknowledged it as another serious security vulnerability. Now, to address these issues that I introduced, that I introduced one could carefully patch the system, which could be enough in some cases to tackle some of the instances of the vulnerabilities. But when you keep doing that in an ad hoc manner, quickly you end up with a very complicated system with a lot of edge cases and um, with the developer trying to infer what is the right thing to do in every case. Uh, however, we believe it is important, as with any security system design, to identify the root causes of those vulnerabilities and address them in a more systematic way. Uh, so we took an architectural approach aiming to have clean design decisions, which will render future problems harder to arise, but also it will make it easier for Android engineers uh, to make decisions when they write code. Uh, our system is called Casper, um, which is not inspired by the friendly ghost. 
uh, but actually it comes from the definition of the word cusper with a U, which is something that it was uh, born in the cusp of two significant generations. And this is to highlight the fact uh, that our system was implemented at the time that we were transitioning from the install time permission model to the runtime permission model. Uh, these are Casper's uh, major contributions, so probably uh, the most important part of the presentation. Um, first, Android currently does not have the capacity to distinguish between a permission defined by the system and a permission defined by less privileged principles. And as we saw, this can lead to privilege escalation attacks. Uh, Casper introduces a clean separation between system and custom permissions, making it easier uh, for Android engineers to make security uh, decisions and harder for future problems to arise. Second, currently any application can spoof or claim custom permissions which other applications use to protect their components. Uh, Casper introduces an effective naming convention which is also backward compatible with the existing uh, functionality of the system. Uh, and the necessary system extensions that come with that to track custom permission ownership. Lastly, the numerous previous vulnerabilities reported by previous works, in addition uh, to the ones we discovered, they provide ample evidence that the current software testing methodologies of the permission model are insufficient. Uh, so Casper is gonna take this a step further and is the first version of the Android runtime permission model that is formally modeled and formally verified to be correct with respect to fundamental security properties. Uh, next I'll walk you through some permission related tasks that are being performed on the Android platform just to demonstrate some of the Casper's enhancements. Uh, the Android framework stores a list of all system, uh, of all permissions in the system in appropriate data structures. This is what is being depicted on the right hand side of the screen. So when, now we install an application that declares a custom permission, this permission will be indexed in that data structure using its name as the index key. The first thing Casper will do is to extend these data structures to hold information regarding the type of the permission. This way we can now cleanly distinguish between what is a system defined permission and what is a third party application defined permission. Uh, Casper also introduces a new naming convention for custom permissions. Uh, custom permissions will be prefixed by the declare application signature. And this is in contrast with other works that typically use the package name as the identifier of the app. Uh, we believe this is a bad approach because this is susceptible to attacks from repackaged applications. And also, it's important to use the signature because we can keep some of the functionality. This keeps us to, allows us to be backward compatible with some of the functionality of the signature uh, uh, custom permissions. So now, when an application tries to include a custom permission in a system permission group uh, to elevate its privileges, we can readily disallow this is we can detect that this is something requested or uh, something that happened by permission that is actually declared by an untrusted principle. Also for backward compatibility, Casper does not assume that developers will use our naming convention. In fact, applications can keep declaring permissions exactly the same way as they did before. Uh, but since Casper indexes custom permissions based on new names or new index keys, now when an application requests a custom permission, we need to make sure that the right permission is found and the right permission is granted. So what Casper will do when a permission is requested, it is gonna perform a lookup operation in those data structures to match the requested permission with the actual permission index in the system. And what is gonna be matched here is the custom permission with a suffix the same as the name that is being requested by the developer. And also Casper now is gonna perform the name translation operation the other way around to make sure that it actually grants the right permission to the app because for each application we also track uh, what permissions are actually granted to the app um, during the life, uh, lifetime of the application on the system. Uh, so now if we have, if you remember the second attack, the second vulnerability where Skype comes in and declares its own permission but we had this problem with the naming convention, as far as our system is concerned, uh, this is a completely different permission in the system, so essentially we are rendering any permission spoofing, spoofing attacks to be completely ineffective. Uh, we have implemented Casper in Android 6.0 and we have evaluated its performance with respect to uh, different affected operations. To measure its overhead when installing an application, we repeated this operation 100 times on the original system and 100 times on the Casper system, and we found that Casper introduces a 2.5 millisecond overhead 
Uh, but this is a very small fraction out of the 1,700 milliseconds that it takes to complete an installation of, um, of any application. We also measure the time it takes to grant access to a protected component. Uh, here I show a requested access to a service, to a background service, uh, that is protected with a signature custom permission. And we didn't find any uh, change between the two other than um, some uh, standard vari uh, variation. We further measured the time it takes to grant a dangerous permission. The average overhead here was two milliseconds, uh, which is not noticeable if you think about that this is a task that requires user interaction. Um, so adding two milliseconds either before the user interface dialog boxes pop up or after they are being removed um, is definitely not the bottleneck here because just to render those boxes, it takes hundreds of milliseconds because this has to be an operation that the user has to be able to perceive. In terms of effectiveness, we empirically verified that real phones, um, on real phones, that the phone vulnerabilities are completely eliminated in Casper uh, by testing all possible attack scenarios and backward compatibility cases that we could think of. But in this work, we went a step further and actually formally verified that Casper is correct with respect to fundamental properties. Uh, we believe this is an important step since a formal representation of the system allows us to explore many cases which would be at the very least difficult to do uh, empirically or with current software testing methodologies. In particular, we manually inspected the implementation of the Android runtime permission model, and we created the first formal model of, of this scheme using the Alloy specification language. And we then utilized this model to check two fundamental permission-related security properties. First, that dangerous permissions should never be granted without user interaction. And second, an application's components should never be accessed by unauthorized applications. With the original model of the Android runtime permission model, both of these properties were violated, and these correspond to the uh, vulnerabilities and the attack cases that I explained in the beginning of the presentation. Uh, however, with the model of our implementation, of Casper's implementation, both of these properties are now satisfied. So this greatly improves our confidence regarding the security that is provided by our system. So in summary, we have performed an in-depth analysis of the runtime permission model focusing on custom permissions which reveal serious security vulnerabilities. Uh, in response, we have designed Casper which incorporates mechanisms for distinguishing between custom permissions and system permissions and we introduce a strategy, um, an easy and backward compatible strategy for tracking permission ownership and finally, we developed the first formal model of 100 runtime permissions, and we use this to formally verify the correctness of Casper. Um, so I'll leave you with this, and I'll conclude my presentation, and I'll be happy to address any questions you might have. Did you look into any kind of regression testing or anything to make sure that Cusper didn't uh, change or any critical components to Android or introduce anything new that may be a problem? Right. Um, so first I want to say that it's, it's very important to be backward compatible uh, because as Parisa said this morning, uh, it might take years uh, if you want to go with a complete refactoring of the system. So we took special care for our system to be backward compatible. So all the decisions we've made in the design of the system uh, were with that in mind, that we won't break any functionality. But uh, pertaining to your question exactly, uh, we actually manually tested uh, different scenarios uh, that we wanted to make sure that uh, worked and we won't break anything. Uh, but also, as I said, the decisions we've made were all with that in mind that we're not going to break anything in the system. Everybody's hungry. Right. <laughs> I guess. He's on the job market, tracking down at lunch.